Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, Tomcat Center Tackling Global Challenges event. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for your uh, patience as we uh, deal with a little uh, internet connectivity issue. Um, if you're new to this uh, series, this event series, let me uh, just briefly tell you what it's about. Uh, so basically what we do is we uh, highlight a uh, particular problem area in sustainability, and then we engage uh, outside experts to uh, provide uh, insight into the, the nature of the problem and the origins of the problem, and to help uh, identify opportunities for developing solutions. Uh, so last year was our uh, inaugural season for this uh, event series, and we uh, we focused on the, the broad problem of uh, plastic production and plastic waste. Uh, this year, our topic is tropical deforestation. Um, we chose this topic primarily because of uh, its critical importance and unique urgency. Uh, so tropical deforestation has uh, an outsized impact on climate change. Uh, deforestation is thought to account for uh, at least 10% of anthropogenic uh, GHG emissions, which is sort of a, a staggering number if you think about uh, all of the emissions from fossil energy use. Um, more important, uh, arguably, than, than the emissions associated with, with cutting down forests uh, is the fact that as we uh, lose forest coverage, we also lose uh, a incredible carbon sink. And so we basically reduce our long-term potential for sequestering and storing carbon on the planet. Uh, but then beyond emissions, uh, tropical forests are, hold something like uh, roughly half of the species of life uh, on the planet. And uh, deforestation and uh, related phenomenon of forest degradation drives uh, mass extinction of these species, uh, resulting in irreversible and uh, in many cases incalculable loss of biodiversity. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm really uh, honored uh, and, and pleased to uh, welcome our, uh, welcome two individuals who have really um, spent their careers working to understand deforestation and uh, develop uh, and implement solutions to uh, halt deforestation. Um, but, but before I uh, introduce our, our first uh, speaker, um, I want to highlight uh, one other uh, opportunity that we're really excited about at the Tomcat Center that synergizes um, with this series on tropical deforestation. So, so just this fall, we launched a new program called Tomcat Solutions, um, where we will help uh, teams, and these can be teams of students, uh, faculty, staff, uh, researchers, scholars, et, et cetera. Uh, we help them through uh, three phases of support to develop uh, rapidly deployable solutions to critical problems in sustainability. Um, and we've highlighted two problem areas, one of which is uh, tropical deforestation. Um, so if you are, are listening to this uh, event today and you're inspired to, uh, to try to develop a solution um, to to think of a way to address this problem or its underlying causes and nucleate a team to help you do that. Um, or if you already do research in this area and you're interested in um, working to translate your findings into a solution, um, or perhaps you're already um, implementing a solution to deforestation, but you're interested in scaling it up rapidly to maximize its impact. Uh, any and all of the above, uh, we are, are really excited to help you through the Tomcat Solutions Program. Um, Donica will put the, the link to a website where you can find more uh, information about that program. We're doing that in partnership with the Woods Institute, um, as well as a, a new initiative on campus called Emergence, 
um, which is dedicated to uh, purposeful entrepreneurship. Uh, so today, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm honored to welcome our, our two speakers, uh, Matt Leggett and Dan Nepstad. Um, these two individuals uh, have uh, deep expertise in deforestation, um, not just from scholarly work, um, but uh, first and foremost, from many years of direct experience um, working in the field, working in deforestation hotspots, um, and they're both uh, pioneers in developing new strategies to uh, combat deforestation. So um, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna hear uh, presentations from both of them. So I'll provide a, a brief intro to each person individually before their presentation. Um, and then we'll have a, uh, a combined uh, Q&A session after both presentations have concluded. Um, you are welcome and encouraged to submit questions through the uh, poll everywhere function. And then you can vote on, on uh, questions that others submit to bring them to the top of the list. And uh, we will do our best to uh, accommodate all of your questions. Um, so uh, with that, let me, uh, let me now uh, introduce our, our first speaker, uh, Matt Leggett. He is the He's currently the Associate Director for Sustainable Commodities and Private Sector Engagement at the Wildlife Conservation Society. Uh, he's based in the, in the UK uh, at the moment, uh, has been there for the past several months, I believe, um, but really for the past seven or eight years, he has spent the majority of his time in Southeast Asia and in Indonesia in particular, um, working in the field, uh, again, to understand the drivers of deforestation and the tropical forests of Indonesia and to uh, develop solutions. I actually first came across Matt's name uh, in a New York Times article I read in, I believe it was in early August, um, called How Your Cup of Coffee is, is Clearing the Jungle. It's an investigative uh, reporting article on uh, deforestation in ostensibly a protected area in Indonesia. Um, Matt was featured very prominently in that article. It was really sort of a bright spot. Uh, his work and, this, and the success of his work was a, was a bright spot uh, in, that, uh, in that description of this, of this problem. Uh, and so when we uh, selected this area for this series and as one of the critical problem areas to highlight for Tomcat Solutions, um, he was foremost in my mind as someone to reach out to, and we were thrilled uh, that he uh, agreed to, to join us today. Since he's in the UK, um, this is, uh, I guess, a little bit past midnight for him. Uh, so uh, we're especially grateful of his willingness to participate uh, in, in the middle of the night uh, for him. So Matt, uh, without further ado, thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Hi, everyone, and I appreciate that uh, introduction, Matt, and, um, and thank you to everybody also for inviting me to join this um, conversation. Unfortunately, Matt, I'm having some real trouble um, uploading and sharing my screen um, at the moment, so I wonder if I might be able to swap to Dan for the initial uh, presentation, and then by the time I have sorted it out, I feel like I'm going to be better off kind of second. Does that work for you? I'm, I'm not sure if Matt's still on mute or not. Um, 
Apologies Matt, for that. Matt Cannon, do you Thomas. think that we could introduce Dan so that we can proceed with him first? And we'll try to work out Matt Leggett's um, audio and video. Yeah, apologies. I'm clearly spent too much time in the rainforest and not capable of co dealing with Zoom at midnight. But uh, yeah, apologies. It will take, take me a minute to figure this out. Yeah, sorry. I was, I was trying to say, of course, um, I, I am unable to unmute myself with this uh, particular configuration. So uh, yeah, uh, that'll, that'll work fine. Um, sorry for the, the hiccup there. Um, so yeah, let me, um, let me introduce uh, Dan uh, first and, and, and hopefully by the time uh, we get to your presentation, Matt, we'll have that sorted out. So, um, so yeah, um, uh, also very honored to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Dan Nepstad uh, to this event today. Dan is the um, founder and, a, uh, and the president of the Earth Innovation Institute, um, which is uh, much closer to home here at Stanford. It's over, it's based over in Berkeley. Um, but uh, similar to Matt, Dan has spent a, a very large portion of his uh, career working uh, in the field. Uh, in his case, his area of focus uh, has been the Amazon and he has um, over 30 years of uh, experience in the Amazon, studying the drivers of deforestation and helping to uh, craft new programs and implement new and innovative programs uh, to address that problem. Uh, he's one of the world's experts on RED, uh, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in the developing world. Uh, and he's been a, a, a key driver in implementing uh, and trying to scale that mechanism for protecting tropical forests. Um, he, uh, prior to the Earth Innovation Institute, he was a senior scientist at the Woods Hole Inst uh, Research Center, um, chief program officer of the environmental, uh, of environmental conservation at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, uh, the foundation with a, a, a lot of ties to, to Stanford. Uh, and a lecturer at Yale University, uh, where he uh, obtained his PhD in forestry. So, uh, so Dan, thank you very much for, for joining us. Okay, well, uh, thank you for that introduction, Matt, and I'm delighted to be part of this series. And uh, I, I love the focus on solutions of, of of, uh, of the Tomcat Institute. And um, I wanna share with you just some stories about the Brazilian Amazon. Um, I love the Brazilian Amazon. I, I moved there in 1984 and uh, to start my, my PhD research and sort of never look back, I feel like. And, um, <clears throat> and wanna make some connections to the people of the Amazon, uh, governors, farmers, and others. And, uh, I think in the long run, it's it's those people who are in key positions to determine how the land of the Amazon is managed, who really, if they embrace this agenda of keeping the forest standing and, and building a development model around it, they can make uh, all the difference in the world and the future of this forest. I'm going to pull up some slides here, um, and hopefully this works well, and that everyone can see those. Um, the Amazonians are why I'm optimistic about the Amazon, those who live in the forest, in the forest region. Uh, I'll organize my comments along these uh, four topics. There was a huge decline in deforestation. How did it happen? And why has deforestation doubled since then? Um, <clears throat> what are the big zero deforestation sourcing commitments that companies have made? Are they working? And uh, some really good news, I think, reinforced by some of the decisions in Glasgow last week uh, about uh, net zero movement and the governors of the Amazon's proposal for keeping the forest standing. First of all, why should we care about the Amazon? Uh, Matt already referred to some of the reasons. Uh, the statistic that really hits me is if we think of the last 10 years of, of global emissions of CO2 to the atmosphere, 
that's about the same amount of carbon that's stored in the trees of the Amazon. If all of that wood and those roots and branches were to be cut down and, and burned, that's about the amount we, of CO2 we'd get into the atmosphere. And it's leaking into the atmosphere right now through deforestation, through degradation from logging and fire. And it could be that really severe droughts become more significant. It's something that was the focus of my research for about 20 years, uh, pushing the forest to see how much drought it can take before it starts to fall apart, before the giant canopy trees uh, don't have enough water and die. And, and at what point in a drought do, does the forest, which is usually incredibly tolerant of, of drought and, and, and resistant to fire, starts to become inflammable. And that's what the key is to the forest dieback, this interaction between rainfall, severe drought, and fire getting into the forest, which is usually very difficult to burn. Uh, and if that happens at a big scale, not only the carbon going into the atmosphere, but also the amount of energy that's processed by the forest itself as it evaporates huge amounts of water uh, under the equatorial sun, that's so big that many, many climate models show that <clears throat> if we lose a big chunk of the Amazon forest, weather is going to be different. It's going to be different in Iowa. It's going to be different in California and, and could have implications for the monsoon. But also a, a note of optim optimism. Uh, there's still time to keep 80% of the forest standing, and that's what I want to move to now. I'm not gonna go through all of these historical events that I've superimposed here on uh, the annual deforestation uh, in, the, in the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, so you can see that sometimes 30,000 square kilometers of forests are cut down in, in a single year. And that trend has decreased uh, generally since 2004. Even today, uh, deforestation rates are less than half of where they were at their peak. And that's good news. Uh, an important point about this emission, this decline in, in deforestation is that it was driven in part by the anticipation of a new carbon market, a global carbon market. Uh, anyone who can remember the climate summit in Copenhagen in 2009, also a very cold, long-lined uh, COP like we, we had in Glasgow uh, this last two weeks, um, it didn't happen. The, the climate, the carbon market did not come together. And because of that, partly because of that, 7 billion tons of CO2 that are no, not in the atmosphere, that, that carbon is in trees in the Amazon, only 4% of that Brazilian contribution to cl climate change solutions has been compensated. The way that deforestation declined is a, is a long, complex story. It's an interagency strategy hatched to really crack down on illegal activities, including cartels that operate in the Amazon around illegal timber and minerals and, and land. Um, there was a, a, a two thirds increase in the area of the Amazon under formal protection by, by national parks and, and reserves. Uh, under indigenous territories, also um, well, well protected, uh, in that case, extractor reserves. Um, there was other measures taken, such as uh, suspending access to public credit lines to, to all the farmers in high deforestation municipios or counties. Um, an extraordinary array of measures were taken, and it worked. Deforestation declined about 78%, and as we saw in that graph, <clears throat> But I should point out this, all of the things I just mentioned are mostly negative measures, negative in the sense of just saying no to, to those who would clear forests, uh, short on carrots, not a whole lot of positive incentives for farmers uh, or other actors to do the right thing, who are doing, doing the right thing. Same, same graph here, but let's focus now on that period from 2012 to the right. It's been a period of doubling of deforestation. We don't have this figured out yet. And what's going on there? The, first of all, the Brazilian Amazon, I, I love to talk about it because 
it's been such a huge laboratory. Everyone knows about the Amazon. And, and usually if you read in the, in the news about something in the Amazon, it's probably happening in the Brazilian side where, where 60% of the Amazon forest is located. But over the last 12 years, uh, the Amazon fund was created, you know, a big bet by Norway, Germany and others to basically reward emissions reductions that are achieved by slowing deforestation through the Amazon fund. And uh, that's three of the 4% of the emissions reductions that have been compensated, about a billion and a half dollars. Um, not all uh, great, uh, agile, you know, effective finance. Uh, one government I just talked to has for seven years been trying to spend their, their Amazon fund money. It comes from the, through the Brazilian Development Bank and it's rather bureaucratic. So they've only spent 60% in seven years. Um, we've had hundreds of corporate pledges, um, <clears throat> about 500 globally, to remove deforestation from supply chains uh, of palm oil, soybeans, beef, uh, timber, pulp, and other things. And two of those commodities are very big drivers of deforestation, uh, beef production and soybeans in the Amazon region. We've had something like the Brazilian Soy Moratorium, which really predated the zero deforestation corporate commitments, which we'll talk about right now. Did it work? We, we had companies representing 90% of all the buyers of soybeans grown in the Amazon region, basically saying, listen, if your soybeans are grown in an area cleared after 2008, we're not gonna buy it. And it was enforced. Um, the problem is farmers didn't like it. They rejected the moratorium because what about the farmers who have more forests than is required by law? In Brazil, that's a really big, big deal. You, you have to keep 80% of your farm under forest in Brazil. And some farmers, they really like forests and they've been keeping more forests. And now you're told that even you know 20% you can't clear. So there weren't a whole lot of soy farmers in that category, but it was really more the principle. And so in this sense, the, the soy moratorium lost a key ally, uh, as we'll see in a few minutes. Farmers control a huge amount of forest in the Amazon. And if they're not on board with this, they could push to eliminate the forest code and then we'd have a free for all. So had the soy moratorium made an exemption for those farmers who have a little bit of forest they can still clear legally, uh, it would have landed much more positively. Just to give you a quick glimpse of what the Brazilian Forest Code is, uh, it's, it's the world's most uh, ambitious, let's say, forest conservation policy that applies to private land. Uh, I already mentioned 80% of your farm has to be forested in the Amazon, your riparian zones, uh, headwaters of streams, steep slopes, all that has to remain under forest. And uh, it's 35% in the Cerrado part of the Brazilian Amazon and 20% legal requirement in the Cerrado elsewhere. <clears throat> well, let's talk about an actor that you rarely see in the news. The Wall Street Journal carried a piece on, on Mato Grosso just about a week ago, two weeks ago, I guess. And I was delighted to see that because these are very powerful figures. They've got huge budgets, they have big economies, it's a federation, so like in the United States, governors have quite a bit of autonomy to make rules and control their budgets and to control big chunks of the, of the state. In 2009, here in California uh, was formed something called the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force that included several governors from the Brazilian Amazon and it was called by Arnold Schwarzenegger, who had pushed through the Global Warming Solutions Act, which is the basis of our cap and trade here. And there's a part of that called international offset provisions. And basically he wanted the governors to prepare for this flow of finance coming from the really big emitters who are capped under the, under the cap and trade, who have an option of, of basically offsetting a few percentages of their of their emissions to achieve uh, the target. And in 2021, 12 years later, 
they're still waiting. The offsets program has never been implemented, although we do have the California Tropical Forest Standard. In 2014, governors from 35 provinces and states around the world in the tropics, Indonesia is included there, Mexico, Peru, Colombia. I forgot to say, by the way, that um, Earth Innovation is headquartered here in, in Berkeley, but we're, we have offices in, in Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Um, so we're very close to, to a lot of these governors. They said, we're gonna cut deforestation 80% by 2020 if there's sufficient finance and partnerships. And basically neither material, materialized. A few states got finance, a few states got, got partnerships with companies uh, as we've reviewed recently in a paper. <clears throat> um, but also the Brazilian Amazon governors they're very strong in saying, listen, our job is to implement the law and it's a law and order agenda, but they've also in recent years realized that they have a, a big role to play in partnering with indigenous people and local communities. And there's a whole set of principles uh, developed through the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force that's being implemented today in the Amazon. They're really all about innovation and green growth. That's what gets them votes. And just to look at one state's trajectory, uh, Mato Grosso, uh, it's a giant, oops, I skipped a slide here. I'm sorry, let me, I think we're good now. Okay, what were to happen if the, that law and order agenda of the governors were to be put into practice? Here's a map uh, we developed for the Brazilian Amazon. The dark green are protected areas, or indigenous areas, I should say. The light green are uh, formal public uh, protected forest. The orange is what I really want you to look at. Those are farms. Those are farmers who have submitted. There's some land grabbers in there. Hopefully they'll be, they'll be filtered out, but these are four farms who have submitted their rural environmental registry applications and that gives them the right to do business and those are the forests that are by far the most vulnerable in the region they're literally right next to cattle pastures and soy fields and so if the forest code were to drop those areas in orange would all be up for grabs and um, without those forests protected uh, it's going to be really hard to keep forests in the Amazon above even 70%, let alone 80%. So this is a big deal. And if the, 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 the lower right-hand part of that map is a state called Mato Grosso, it's Brazil's biggest agricultural producer. Um, we just estimated 10% of, of, there we go, okay, China's imports of soybeans, China imports 100 million tons of the 160 million tons of annual trade in soybeans globally, and 10% of it comes from this one state. In this figure, we can see the real measured values of forests on the left and projections out through 2030 uh, that are embedded in the state's formal uh, multi-stakeholder supported targets. So basically, this state was emitting just from deforestation in the early aughts about the same amount of carbon dioxide as the entire economy of California, the world's fifth largest economy. Lots of deforestation, some years uh, almost 12,000 square kilometers. And we can see um, how the total forest area, prime area forest in dark green declined. And that little dotted line is the net emissions. The light green is the area of secondary forest and the orange is the area of forest lost each year. Now, going forward, there's a public policy in place uh, to basically build forests back up. There's a huge area of secondary forests that basically, if farmers see a little incentive for not clearing it and for protecting it from fire, a lot of them will do that because these secondary forests are in second are marginal lands. They're not very good for, for farming or, or livestock. And there's also a 3 million hectare target, official target of the state for restoring forests along riparian zones. If all of this works, it means that the forest, uh, the forests of the state become net negative in terms of CO2 emissions in about 2027. 
And this is entirely plausible. But more importantly, too, you can see forest area total getting back up to where it was in 2001. And that's good to prevent the forest dieback. That's good to prevent the tipping point, uh, as often has been referred to, of being reached. This is Governor Mauro Menges. We just held a dinner for him in Glasgow, and he announced his uh, intention to bring his entire state to carbon neutrality by 2035. There's some pretty solid research behind those numbers. He didn't do it lightly. Uh, and here's a little bit of the history of what the state has done. Deforestation plan launched in Copenhagen Climate Summit of 2009. Uh, the law that sets up its red REDD uh, framework for the state to basically sell forest carbon credits about nine years ago. <laughs> and 2015, this very ambitious set of goals for increasing production, increasing forest conservation, and including smallholders and indigenous people in the state's development strategy launched in Paris. 2017, indigenous peoples, every one of 41 tribes of indigenous nations of the state uh, spread out across 87 indigenous territories was part of a consultation and they are now getting benefits through carbon finance uh, coming in from Germany and the UK, a deal that was closed in 2018. And I already mentioned the carbon neutral uh, target. <clears throat> so this is a, a very um, inspiring story, right? We have a, a state that's a, an agricultural powerhouse and it's already made huge achievements. It wants to complete the journey. There's a price tag. It needs about 37 billion to get there, uh, one state. What was announced in Glasgow was about 19 billion over the same period, 2030. So one state could absorb twice the Glasgow commitment on forests. Fortunately, a lot of that funding could come from normal agricultural financial mechanisms. It does deliver a profit. Uh, we estimate that forest carbon transactions, now that there's a net zero uh, dri driven increase in the demand for forest carbon credits, jurisdictional credits, meaning comprehensive statewide programs like Mato Grosso has, not isolated uh, forest carbon projects, that could deliver about 10 million. And is that enough? Uh, that would make a huge difference to Mato Grosso succeeding in this journey. The way forward then, just to close, um, there's a huge need for finance. And, and I tend to look at the net zero movement and I know there's a lot of greenwashing in there, but this is finally the chance that we were hoping would materialize after Copenhagen and didn't. Um, in the Peruvian Amazon, there's a $4.5 billion price tag for the regional governments there to make that journey. We're seeing indigenous people and local communities we're starting to receive long awaited benefits and, and, and a seat at the table. That's set, certainly happening in Mato Grosso in the state of Acre in the Brazilian Amazon. And that story is, needs to be better told. There's the need, I think, for a new narrative in the Amazon where forests are the basis of rainfall security. Rainfall in the Amazon is dependent partially on forest cover. So the culture, the economy, the traditions of the Amazon are tied to the forest uh, in ways that are not broadly understood uh, or appreciated among Amazonians. And then there's the need in the international community, I'd say, to recognize meaningful progress in slowing deforestation, in reducing emissions, and not let the perfect, such as zero deforestation or zero emissions, become the enemy of the good, which is reduced deforestation and reduced emissions. So thank you all for, for the time and I look forward to the dis discussion to follow. Terrific, uh, thank you so much, Dan. I, uh, lots of questions uh, on, on my end and <coughs> the audience. Uh, I, I think uh, what, what we can do now, hopefully uh, if, if he's ready is um, move into Matt's presentation and then we will have a combined uh, Q and A after that. So Matt, uh, if you if you can, I think Matt's going to keep his video off because of his connectivity issues, and uh, hopefully he's able to share his uh, materials.
great. Great. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dan. Um, as always, it's a pleasure hearing you talk uh, about the Amazon. Um, and thank you, everyone, again. And apologies for my connectivity issues. So I, I will probably touch some of the same areas that Dan um, covered so well. So apologies for that. But um, I think it's worth saying twice because it's an important issue. So let's go. Um, so I think uh, the first thing to say is, you know, we're coming out of a COVID um, pandemic and, you know, it's an incredible, um, it's been an incredible jolt to culture and society in the world. And I've always liked this, uh, this image, this cartoon, uh, which I think throws things into perspective quite nicely. Uh, you know, COVID-19 is uh, an enormous, enormous jolt. Uh, it, it's somewhere in the region of $29 trillion of lost uh, income or input uh, into the financial system just in the last 18 months to two years. Um, and that is going to be dwarfed by the impacts of climate change and again dwarfed by the impacts of biodiversity collapse that will follow um, the climatic um, uh, situation we're facing in the next 20 or 30 years. So I think, um, you know, when we talk about protecting forests, why protect forests at all? Well, really they're fundamentally important as Dan mentioned in in this global picture um, you know somewhere between uh, around a quarter of total carbon emissions are absorbed by you know intact forests globally so that's forests which are remain largely undisturbed by human um, activities and um, you know somewhere in the region of 30 percent um, uh, of our of our actions in the land use sector can contribute towards meeting our meeting our kind of 1.5 degree global targets by, by 2050. So the work we do in forestry and in, in, in environmental protection of forests is, is absolutely fundamentally important to uh, the climate change picture going forwards. I think um, it's particularly relevant um, in the tropics um, because tropical ecosystems in particular will be threatened by, by some of the trajectories and trends which we're looking at um, over the next 20 to 30 years. And there are three large gaps, um, if you like, which, which we can look at. So one is, is fundamentally the need to grow more food. We need somewhere in the region of 50% to 56% more crop calories by 2050. And we need to, we need to get that food on, on much less land than we're currently growing the food on. So a new area of land is needed roughly twice the size of India um, in that period of time. And all of that needs to be done at a much lower cost of the environment. So 11 gigatons of uh, CO2 equivalent emissions need to be reduced in that food system in order for us to um, maintain our, our climate targets. So there's a fairly significant challenge at a kind of macro level. Um, and, you know, when we look at the commodities which are driving global deforestation, particularly in the tropics, um, you know, the left hand side of this graph, which I hope you can all see is it really tells a very compelling story about the way in which we need to consider our, our diet and dietary changes. Beef in particular is a fundamentally important part of the conversation going forwards. But you'll see also the other commodities on the right hand side of the graph, the, the rice, sugar and other plant based fibers, those will also become increasingly important over time. So while beef is, is fundamentally important and palm oil is obviously fundamentally important in that second column, there will be other things that are that are coming through. And I just to, just to flick up this graph on on uh, on demand as well. There's a, some really interesting data coming out now on, on projected demand increases for different commodities, commodity crops. Um, you know, you can see the palm oil indications there over 200%. More palm oil is likely to be needed. Um, you know, in, in the next coming years, and Indonesia in particular have set some fairly ambitious targets for increasing the palm oil production more than more than double their current production is their anticipated target. So there are, there are going to be some fairly seismic changes to the food system as, as we move forward. And what does this all mean um, when we get down to the ground and we look at conservation? And I wanted to just share some very kind of headline overviews of some of the lessons that um, I've certainly picked up from working in Indonesia and other places. You know, I, I think, you know, I work for, a, uh, I think you'd probably say a relatively conservative um, conservation NGO. And for many years, um, uh, conservation has, has proceeded um, in relative isolation from the impacts um, of the wider world. You know, when, when I started 
in this field not even that long ago, 20, 20 something years ago. Conservationists were often in areas which were far from the far from the frontier, far from the forest and agricultural frontier. And that has now shifted very fundamentally. Conservationists are now working directly at the forest and farm frontier. Um, and simply, you know, doing work on the inside of protected areas, which is, you know, important for biodiversity, isn't really enough anymore to, to think about, um, you know, dealing with these wider pressures. And so I think in Indonesia in particular, you know, this idea that I was, I was pushing forward quite hard was this idea of, you know, it's important to protect the, the core and monitor biodiversity and halt forest loss. But in and around that core, you need to think about market-based solutions to reduce deforestation and reduce conversion pressure. And then in the broader landscape, as Dad mentioned, you know, the need to have really interesting and, and different conversations with, with uh, governors and the regulatory systems that exist in those places are absolutely fundamental to, to support a wider sustainable transition. Um, and, you know, as Dan also mentioned, there's been an enormous growth in the number of corporate sustainability plans, but also uh, jurisdictional sustainability plans and policies that have come out over the last over the last decade. Um, part of the challenge has been really that many of those are not really seeing the, the, the progress they need to see on the ground to make to make impact. And just to draw out a quick example from um, from Indonesia, uh, and this I think probably you know Matt uh, may have seen this in this New York Times article. Uh, so this is a, a really neat example of, of some of the problems as a national park in southern Sumatra. Um, which has become a major growing center for um, uh, robusta coffee. And coffee has made its way through the global supply chain and ended up on, on many of our breakfast tables around the world. Um, so somewhere in the region of 10% of this UNESCO World Heritage Site is now under active cultivation for coffee. Um, so in this particular landscape, and, and that photo you can see there of the, of the guy on the motorbike is always quite telling for me, the sign in, in the background says in uh, Indonesian that you're entering a national park and you know no no access is uh, permitted and behind all you can see pretty much is as far as the, the camera goes is is very thriving and healthy coffee plantations there's very little forest in that particular area so in this in this example you know we we set about trying to come up with a, a different approach really linking market-based solutions getting eight to ten of the largest producers of coffee in this in this landscape to sign on to a statement of intent to look at sourcing um, coffee differently um, with farmers that are committed to zero deforestation principles. Um, and there is a set of incentives and, and um, uh, I guess the carrot and stick approach was used quite heavily here. So we worked with farmers to provide them with loans and access to cheap finance, um, training and incentives um, uh, with their kind of production uh, practices. Um, post harvest improvement, all of these kinds of things, um, and, and linking that into the supply chain. So the companies who are involved were able to um, guarantee that they were engaging in a zero deforestation um, partnership and the farmers were getting better prices and yields for their coffee. Um, and I think, you know, what what's telling about this is that it's incredibly hard. Um, this one small area around about half a million hectares of rainforest um, it's been under, uh, it's been facing challenges from, from uh, encroachment for more than 20 years. Um, and I think it's, it's fair to say that in many of these landscapes, it's going to take at least 20 years to, to reverse some of the um, unfortunate trends that have led to deforestation encroachment. So I think um, kind of having that in mind is, is important when we, when we look at these sorts of solutions. I think kind of scaling up a little bit to kind of a global level, you know, there's a there's a real mix of challenges um, behind uh, the sort of tropical deforestation conundrum at the moment. And largely there are a mix of market failures and regulatory failures. Um, so whether it's uh, the kind of market failures I mentioned, sort of farmers not getting enough income and that, and that driving an, uh, an increased incentive towards encroachment in order to just, to just simply grow enough food that they can sell in order to make a decent living. There's uh, some fundamental market failures around that. Um, and the regulatory failures, um, you know, are, are increasingly, you know, on front and centre, particularly post COP, um, and the kind of governance and climate task force that um, Dan mentioned is, is a great example of a, of a step in the right direction there. I think the other thing for me, which really stands out, is, is the need to triage our efforts um, as conservationists. Um, there are some really good opportunities now to triage our efforts towards the most high risk areas first. Um, unfortunately. Uh, 
many of the things that have happened in the private sector in the last decade have been um, happening on areas which perhaps haven't been priorities from, from biodiversity and conservation perspectives. They've been happening on degraded land, often far from the forest and farm frontier, um, where it's easier and safer and, uh, and frankly, supply chain traceability is a little bit more straightforward. So there's some challenges there. You know, we really need to think about how we engage with smallholder farmers, indigenous peoples at these really uh, important um, transition points uh, between forests and farms. And that really will, will need an extension of the horizon of corporate responsibility. At the moment, many companies are simply involved in the act of buying and trading commodities. And increasingly, there's going to need to be a, a step change towards how companies take responsibility and work with the people who are growing the commodities that we use every day. Um, and again, going back to Dan's point about Brazil, I think there's a really poorly articulated narrative around um, the business case for, for conservation and protection. You know, this idea of forests as natural infrastructure, this idea of, of, of forests as a, as a rainfall generation machine um, is, has been, you know, is, is relatively well understood by science, has been, but it's been fairly poorly articulated both in the public and private sectors. And I think that needs to change. Um, and, you know, great news about COP and, and some really interesting um, and positive examples of finance, um, finan financial commitments. But I think one of the things that we're seeing, certainly at a site-based level or a project-based level, is that those enormous sums of money um, often don't really trickle down, simply because very few projects or jurisdictions are able to handle such large sums. And I think Brazil is possibly a, uh, I wouldn't say an exception, but certainly one of the sort of places where that is perhaps less relevant. Um, Mato Grosso is a, is a great example of that. But that in, in many cases, what we're looking for is, is sums of money to get ideas off the ground and get things going at, at the sort of one to $10 million scale. And often the sums of money, the ticket sizes that are being discussed are often in the hundreds to uh, you know, several hundreds of millions of dollars. And the, there are very few places where that kind of money can be absorbed. And I, I, I'm probably running out of time. So very quickly, I would also say that one size doesn't fit all in terms of our interventions. Um, so in Asia, for example, and this, this, this map kind of neatly demonstrates the difference between the work in Brazil and the work in Asia. You know, the distribution of field sizes and farms um, around the world is, is fundamentally different. So the, the work that you would do in the Amazon basin with large ranches, large cattle ranches would be very, very different from the work you would do in um, the Indonesian rainforests or in Papua New Guinea. Um, so, you know, for example, just in Indonesia, 75% of deforestation outside major concessions has occurred in just a relatively small number of villages. So there's a really different set of dynamics at play in, in, in different parts of the world, and that needs to be taken into account. I'll just skip one slide there and just 30 seconds on some of these macro level trends and opportunities. You know, I think what we're seeing um, here is a real shift. There's going to be a real dietary shift uh, and production shift, which is you know, really going to lead us towards a sort of second wave agricultural revolution. Um, and I think there's some really interesting opportunities there for some innovation and, and deep thinking. Um, and similarly, you know, there's, I think there's going to be a sort of paired with that, there's going to be a financial revolution, you know, as, as traditional asset classes become very risky. Um, uh, we, we need, this money will need a home. And at the moment, that home isn't entirely clear. Um, so there's going to be some really interesting work around big data and radical transparency around uh, around forests and farms, I think, um, is already making making big big leaps and change. Um, but you know, trying to change the way that transactions can be targeted towards uh, good things as opposed to bad things, um, and giving financial sector tools to tools to manage risk, I think, are going to be really really important. And I guess finally, also, I'd, I'd say, you know, carbon offsetting and insetting is 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 just going to be such a key part of of the next decade of work. Um, and I think it's likely likely to provide somewhere between 20 and 50% of much of the finance needed to address some of these challenges on the ground. So um, I think I'll just, I'll, I'll pause there um, and perhaps go to questions, but I, I wanted to give a kind of view, both from a field level perspective and also potentially sort of give some nice segues into maybe the, the Q and A. Terrific, thanks very much, Matt. And, uh... Uh, certainly from my perspective, that was uh, really nicely complimentary uh, with the content that, that Dan provided. So uh, thanks to both of you for this uh, really insightful view uh, of the problem and, and of uh, opportunities 
to uh, address it. Um, I think uh, I, I'd like to start with basically with a question to both of you, and maybe Matt, you could answer first, and then Dan second. This is something that uh, several of the audience members have uh, raised, and it's obviously something very timely. If you could um, maybe just provide some some really high level summary uh, remarks on uh, the outcome from COP26 with respect to the forest declaration, and, and um, you know how you how you see that uh, affecting the trajectory of of addressing deforestation. Maybe Matt, if you could. Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, no, it's a, yeah, it's a it's a uh, a really important question. I mean, from my perspective, I think that the real shift has been a COP that um, nature has become uh, front and center of the climate negotiations, um, and a realization of the importance of that has has become very um, very evident. Um, for me, the most exciting thing is is really a. Uh, almost a change in language, you know, a recognition that indigenous peoples are fundamentally important to this to this um, narrative. I think is is new. Sadly, it shouldn't have been, but it is. Um, and and you know, for the first time, we're seeing um, the financial sector sitting up and taking notice um, uh, of the material risk this this conversation presents, and putting money behind um, some of these pledges. And I think um, you know the devil's in the detail. There's there's a lot of work to be done about how this actually you know lands. But I think you know for me I was I was it, it didn't produce as much as I, I would have hoped. But there there were some really kind of positive signs of progress. Um, and I suspect that uh, we're going to be having some interesting conversations in the next six months about how to actually make good on many of those pledges. Thank you, and, and Dan, I I know you touched on, on some of these. Uh, some of these points in your talk, but if you can kind of summarize your your feelings on the outcome from the COP26. Yeah, I think uh, this is certainly the most energized COP I've been to. I think I've been to 17 at this point. Um, and uh, and so much focus on nature. Uh, that was, you know, on, on the leader's day, uh, just the really big outcome. Nature is sort of up front and center, finally, as Matt already mentioned. For me, cops are, you know, there's the negotiations, there's the protests and the, the outcry from really frustrated people, especially youth. Youth were a, a huge presence at this cop. And then there's the, the deal making and negotiation that, that no one talks about. For me, that third piece was incredibly different this time, you know, we, with real meetings between government leaders from Brazil, especially, and companies and discussion of finance and uh, and just a lot of excitement around that. And basically governors saying, wow, so finally we're gonna get that upfront finance we need to move this agenda forward. So I feel like it was a very, very uh, big deal what happened in Glasgow on many fronts. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I think next what I, I, I wanna focus on is you know, sort of the obstacles to scaling um, the the solutions uh, or, or some of the solutions that you uh, that both of you highlighted. So so maybe Matt, for you, I mean, you talked about um, you know the lessons from the work in Indonesia and um, you know how complex that uh, that particular situation was and how many stakeholders have to be engaged to address deforestation in ostensibly a protected area. Um, what is the biggest obstacle to sort of scaling that approach that that you and others took to address it there and applying it to this, this sort of three percent of these areas that are responsible for 50 percent of the of the forest loss yeah um i mean the biggest challenge for me is is finance and and when i say finance it's not grant funding for conservation ngos it is it is a recognition of finance that needed that's needed to tackle this market failure at the forest frontier. Um, you know, we shouldn't be in a situation where farmers are producing commodities for uh, essentially, you know, almost less than their worth on the global market. You know, there is there is a, there is a fundamental problem if you can buy a cup of coffee cheaper than um, it, it costs to produce. And we can't therefore be surprised if um, farmers are, are incentivized to continue converting converting forest. 
um, in order to in order to make ends meet. So, you know, I think there needs to be a real shift in the way that um, smallholder farmers, in particular, in some of these areas, are, are financed. Um, and that has been that has been a, a kind of a no-go area for traditional financing. Um, really, you know, it's considered to be too hard, too complicated, um, you know, difficult to access. Farmers don't have the right kind of tools, no credit histories, all these kinds of problems. But technology has has started to change that. And I, you know, for me, if we're able to solve some of these problems around using tech to enable finance to go to the place where it's needed, I think we're going to we're going to be able to kind of take some of these ideas to scale. Um, I, I don't think it applies for all all problems and all the challenges. Like, like I, as I mentioned, I think the, the challenges around kind of large scale beef production in Mesoamerica are very, very different. But, you know, certainly from from the perspective of some of these really important intact forest areas, um, you know, 70 to 80 percent of the global food supply comes from smallholders, and so far they've really not been part of this conversation. So I think it's really important that we that we think about finance in that context. And, and Dan, you, you presented a sort of optimistic uh, viewpoint of, of what's possible, certainly in Mato Grosso and, and maybe more broadly in in Brazil. You mentioned that the you know, an obstacle in terms of, you know, just the uh, amount of resources committed to this, but is, is that the, just the biggest issue? Um, or is it really more around, um, you know, being able to distribute the funds effectively in order to implement that program? Yeah, I think, you know, I'll, I'll, for me, the tropical forest agenda is largely about rural development and which has always featured you know building institutions and democratic institutions that can defend the public good and can we build a case in the international community so that those places where progress is, is being made and bringing more transparency to the way public funds are used you know recognizing the rights of, of indigenous people for example uh, making, as Matt referred to, making smallholder farmers who are producing commodities more investable, their, their ventures, all of that gets really gets to building these, this institutional capacity. And that's, that's not a, a very fast process. And where it's happening, you know, I think we need to get behind it and make sure it advances. Where it's not ha ha happening fast enough, make sure that we're on the ground providing that support and, and those incentives. I asked the governor Mato Manages over dinner, you know, did his carbon neutral 2035 announcement cost him votes or win him votes? And he said, it won me votes. But had I said zero deforestation, it would not have won me votes. Uh, and I think those perspectives are really important. What is the case for these local governments and other stakeholders to really take on the forest agenda and to, to feature forests and, and, and their conservation in the development paradigm that, that's adopted. And uh, re related to that, I mean, the both for you, Dan, oh, oh, sorry, yeah, Matt, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, a really interesting point. And this, this point around, um, you know, what are the narratives that, that politicians and uh, particularly governors of some of these states need um, in order to in order to kind of push forward these these you know sustainable tra transition agendas you know and uh, you know at the moment w w one of the things that's really interesting is we're seeing a, you know COVID-19 as being a, another finally you know this connection between health and environment has become become front and center and um, you know people are realizing that there are economic costs and economic opportunities to um, to you know, investing in natural infrastructure investing in nature-based solutions and I think that's uh, that's you know fundamentally important mindset shift mindset shift um, which I think will will help us get to where we need to be but yeah as Dan said it's, it's not a quick process and uh, are there concerns around um, you know if, if there's compensation to not clear forest and that and that um, uh, succeeds. Is there are, are there concerns about the sort of long term sustainability of that of that solution? Um, you know, in, in other words, if you pay somebody not to clear a forest um, this year, 
what sort of guarantees or mechanisms are in place to ensure that it you know doesn't get cleared uh, in, in the future? Maybe the, it's really for both of you, but maybe Dan, if you want to uh, start there. Yeah, I think I think you know the forest carbon finance. Um, it's a, it's going to be a phase, and I think it's <coughs> excuse me a stepping stone to get to uh, robust rural development policies that are delivering a lot of benefits to 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 that region and where people say oh forests are one reason we're accessing markets better forests are one reason we have more secure water supplies where we're not getting flooded where we're not dealing with smoke in our lungs you know three months out of the year during the dry season you know it's i think it's a transition and I think carbon finance is not going to be here for 50 years it's going to be built into the public policies and programs that are themselves as seen as benefiting that particular rural society so you know I, I think I think we have a great opportunity now over the next 10 years um, to use that to deliver uh, finance at scale and and in the process get some companies involved to, to come into agreements with these, get photo ops, but also more importantly, mobilize some of that corporate muscle in terms of delivering technical assistance, delivering credit lines, delivering uh, jobs through setting up processing plants and refine, refining plants you know, in the, the, the regions that they wanna bet on. Thanks, and, and Matt, I don't know if you wanted to comment any more on that, on that topic. I, I think it's hard to add to that, to be honest. I think okay, okay. Pretty much sums up my views too. Okay. Uh, yeah. No. Go. For, go for another question. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so Matt, you you alluded to uh, you know new uh, technologies in terms of uh, innovations in financial transactions. Um, is that the main sort of technological uh, gap, or or the main uh, technology on a wish list of things that would that would help? Uh, implement these these solutions, or are there are there other sort of uh, technology areas that that you know would really be game changers uh, in your view in terms of addressing this problem? Um, I I think I think the the opportunities for technology at the moment are boundless um, in the environment um, sector. Uh, I think what we're seeing increasingly is is People who are recognizing that the applications from um, from different industries can be can be readily applied to kind of the challenges faced by conservation, and I think that's really exciting. So the more people we have from the, the blockchain world who are engaging in environmental challenges around supply chains, the better, because um, I think that will ultimately result in some really interesting outcomes. For example, um, I think the idea of um, the, the the work that's going on around big data, and uh, you know, we've seen. Over the last decade, some fascinating um, tools emerged. You know, uh, some of you may be aware of a tool called Global Forest Watch, which I think is fascinating. There's an equivalent for oceans now. Um, I think you know we're we're heading towards probably an equivalent for um, smallholder farmers and farms. Um, you know, there are there are tools now which can track um, uh, crop crop yields and um, and harvest potential via via drone. You know, I think so. I think there are some incredibly um, powerful technologies uh, out there, and and yet more to come. I think finance is just is just one kind of part of that um, sort of technology bubble. Um, so I, yeah, I think there's there. Are, you know, I, I sometimes wish that every time I went on a field trip, I had a I had someone who understood how to write an app, or, or someone who understood how to uh, design a kind of uh, a blockchain solution, because it would be. It would be a real uh, game changer to some of the conversations we have with with field teams um, if we had different mindsets engaged in that conversation. Terrific, thank you. And uh, Dan, I don't know if there's other technology areas you want to highlight, I would just touch on one other area that I think is really exciting, where the state of Mato Grosso has all of this planet data, high resolution satellite data, and they're now making it so that within hours of a deforestation event, they know where it took place, whose tax number is on that property, who is the nearest uh, enforcement agent who can go to that place, or do they need a helicopter? And it's all being carried on a smartphone by those enforcement agents. So it's, it's really 
making it possible to catch people in the act. And, and of course you need the other side, right? You need all of the innovation and where technology makes it cool for youth to be part of environmental agendas, even if it means living far from cities and, um, and not being able to see your friends every day. But uh, anyway, I, I agree that it's a huge, huge piece of the solution. Yeah, and maybe I'll bring up one other area um, in light of uh, some of the data, some of the projections, um, Matt, that you showed about um, increased demand for palm oil and, and other crops, you know, and also just a you know, large increase in food demand. So I'd be interested in hearing both of your thoughts on um, what are the prospects for technologies that create you know, beef alternatives or soy or palm alternatives, what are the prospects or uh, of those really affecting the deforestation problem on a time scale that's, that's relevant for avoiding some sort of tipping point? So, yeah, Dan or, or Matt, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I guess I would, you know, I think I was, sometimes I worry that we've over, overstated the importance of international markets for deforestation. You know, you look at beef in Brazil, it's 80%, it's consumed in local or regional markets. It doesn't get exported. And uh, I worry if sometimes we come down hard on the international piece of that, and that's gonna let the operators who are serving local markets really have free reign and control the, the beef industry. And they, with a very little, little reason to worry about deforestation, but, um, what, it, what gives me hope is uh, seeing the pace at which uh, uh, the efficiency and productivity uh, gains are, are rising. You know, that's a big part of why deforestation was able to come down in, in, in Brazil, even though food production was increasing. And uh, it's mostly in the cattle. Uh, and soy is already extremely productive. Soy, soy in the Amazon is outproducing you know, grain belt, uh, American soy producers. And, um, and I think this greater efficiency of agriculture, it's something that does not get enough attention. Uh, but uh, the Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Environment actually had an op-ed out on that right before the COP and um, calling attention to the fact that Brazil used to be a, a food importing uh, country and now it's one of the top three exporters of food. And, and that gets down to agricultural innovation to, as Matt was saying, you know, getting more from less land with with less of a, an environmental impact. Thank you. And, and Matt, do you want to follow up on, on any of that? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, the, the issue of, of um, increased efficiency in, in food production is, is fundamental. Um, and some of that is about avoiding things which which are inefficient, and some of that is about increasing the efficiency of things that we already have. Um, so I think you know there really isn't a, an argument to be made anymore for for eating beef. You know, if we look at the we look at the com the complexity of the conversations we're having now around kind of technologies which don't yet exist in order to scrub carbon from the atmosphere, uh, and yet we know that we have uh, the, the cattle industry, which is you know one of the largest single driver of, of forest loss globally you know there, it's very difficult to kind of stand on that iceberg and, and still make a case reading hamburgers when when impossible burgers have done something which is really rather good um so i think there you know that's a that's a key part of it I, and as dan said i think the the sort of efficiency piece and perhaps this also connects to technology is the, the food technology of the, the possibilities that, that exist for improving efficiency in, in food production in many of these commodities are still rather large um and I think that's that's exciting. Um, so uh, and and should be a focus of of a lot of our attention going forwards. I mean, you, you know, other than saving nature, the next biggest thing you can do for um, you know, emissions reductions is is to improve the efficiency of how we produce our food. Um, so I think that's you know that pretty much says it all. Thank you. Um, I want to, if I can, take a question directly from the from the audience. So Erica. Uh, Planbeck is a uh, professor here at Stanford from the Graduate School of Business. Erica, do you, uh, you want to ask a question directly? I had one follow-up question. Daniel said that now it's almost possible to catch people in the act in a matter of hours when the fire occurs in a specific place. Um, 
I wonder if it's necessarily necessary to catch people in the act if we know that before or fire has happened within the last months, if the incentives can be put in place to prevent that land from being developed for agricultural purposes. Maybe that would work better in Indonesia where there's a substantial capital investment if it's going to be palm and it takes a long time versus cattle ranching. Um, but how, how, are the, how do you create incentives to um, ensure that if someone starts to develop the land for agricultural purposes that they're prevented from doing so that so that the forest could come back so they wouldn't have an incentive to burn it in the first place there's actually a, a this thing i refer to the car the rural environmental registry um, there's about a million applications in the amazon region five million across brazil once your car is approved and in the system if you deforest clear uh, illegally you're cut off you're embargoed. Your property, if anyone buys your product, they have to pay 500 reais per kilo of product that they're buying. Really hard to collect. Um, there are now about 1,500 embargoed properties in the, in the state of Mato Grosso. Um, <clears throat> it works. I mean, these landholders are doing whatever they can to get off the embargoed list. So I, I think I think there are easier ways than going out, out and, and catching the infractors in the act. And they, they get to good land use uh, planning and, and really translating you know, what the, the law says into practice through an instrument like, like the car. Not, not there yet, it, it just the validation process is going super slow, but the potential is there. That's really exciting. And then in, for Indonesia, what is the potential? to bring that along? And how would that relate to what's happening with the new traceability regulations in the that are coming out in the EU? Will that support? Yeah, OK. Um, I, I think the challenge in Indonesia is that, that the kind of Brazil car equivalent doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a great, um, great model that could be replicated. Um, and, oh. and sadly, in most <laughs> of the provinces and jurisdictions, the, the, the governance doesn't exist either, so there are, there are some real challenges there with, you know, even if you had a, an alert system, there would be no one to answer that alert. Um, so I think there are some kind of more systemic kind of challenges um, in an Indonesian context, um, which need to be solved first. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that's great in Indonesia as an example is they're going through a process called one map, um, where they're trying to align the different mapping, um, the mapping systems of different ministries so you know previously the agriculture ministry had a set of maps the mining ministry had a set of maps yeah. the finance ministry had a set of maps and, and i think one of the things which is a really great step forward for a country like indonesia is really looking at those maps and trying to have a unified um a unified baseline on, on which you're all working and i think that's the first step towards getting towards uh, the kind of thing that uh, brazil have, have managed to do with the car Thank you. Um, so one last area I want to touch on. So um, you've talked about, uh, you know, the private sector, um, you know, really taking the lead and uh, perhaps taking the lead in, in, in financing um, some of these mechanisms to, to protect forests. So, I mean, there certainly are a lot of, you know, very prominent companies with huge carbon footprints that have announced uh, intentions to be, you know, carbon neutral at some point in the future, and they have a huge <laughs> amount of emissions that, uh, you know, for example, things associated with uh, with trans air transport or, or heavy shipping that are just not, you know, feasible to decarbonize with with other technology anytime soon. Um, and so if they really are willing to, you know, pay for offsets, what is the, the roadblock to engaging some of these into, I mean, the, you know, the numbers you put up in the tens of billions are certainly substantial, but uh, not out of the question for uh, some of the, you know, the Microsofts or the Amazons or, or even large, you know, air, airlines who have these huge emissions that frankly, there aren't, there aren't good ways of, of offsetting otherwise. What's the disconnect between engaging them and, and accessing that, that capital and, and deploying it towards you know, some of these mechanisms. 
you know, one, one of the problems is that the sort of jurisdictional state level, province level programs where you have a, a comprehensive program where all of the key stakeholders are at the table and saying what they want to get out of the program, that we still do not have a market for those credits. So no, none of those credits are available. There's lots of buyers and we're getting close. You know, there's art trees, which is one standard for jurisdictional red. There's jurisdictional nested red of, of Vera and others, trop the tropical forest standard of California, which is still not regulated, doesn't have a, a really a, an architecture behind it. So I feel like we're really at the threshold of a very new phase of, of forest carbon uh, transactions and, and scaling up that's, that's really exciting. Um, I think a lot of the subnational jurisdictions and national governments, there's, they still don't quite believe it. They want to see, you know, money flow, and they've been working with pretty slow flows of money from Norway, Germany, UK, and others, um, and that's played an important role. But it's it's more like overseas development assistance, pretty slow. So I think this next phase could see a lot more efficiency of volumes, you know, the corporate relationships with governments and, and other stakeholders that, that could really move the needle on this. So hopefully in a year, we'll, we'll be able to celebrate some, some new deals around this. Thank you. Matt, I don't know if you have an additional perspective on that particular issue. I mean, I support all of that. I think um, there's, a, there's a trust deficit um, you know, the, I think for many uh, tropical forest nations, you know, we've we've been here before. You know, there were conversations, there were, there were promises made around red plus and carbon uh, a decade ago, which never came to fruition, and um, and a lot of people were were quite bent in that process, and and, and many countries have um, are still on a journey back towards trusting that this is real. And I think that is something which needs to be taken into account in, our, in the way in which we approach this, this conversation. And you, you see that, um, you see that in the conversations which have which have happened and are still happening at the COP. You know, in, even in Glasgow, we have conversations still being had around, as Dan as Dan said, you know, people can't quite believe that this is actually likely to happen now. Um, you know, that there's a methodology um, in place and the rule book is is pretty much there, but there's still a lot of distrust that. Um, this will happen and this will happen at scale. I think that needs to be, that needs to be figured out. Great, well, I, I, I wanna close on an uh, optimistic note. Uh, so I, I, I guess I'll give you each, um, you know, one, one uh, opportunity to, uh, to close by saying what the, the opportunity for you personally in this space, what's the most exciting opportunity looking at for the next year or two, um, either the, the project or, the the change you see coming that you're that you're most uh, excited about maybe Matt if if, yeah, if you could start um, so the, the the most the thing I'm most excited about I think is that I feel like we have all of the tools at our disposal now um, you know the the science is is as clear as we've ever had it the um, the, the at least the pledges of the finance world are behind us. Um, developing countries are, are, are largely giving up now to, to kind of get engaged in this problem in a way they haven't done before. We're, we have a we have an alignment of narratives around the importance of forests for health, the importance of forests for the economy, the importance of forests for biodiversity. And I think, um, you know, I'm coming out of COP. I'm extremely excited to see that the world has come together in this way, and I. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that's that's my kind of note of, of uh, optimism for the next for the next twelve months. I I'm, I, re I really do feel like we're at a, we're at a kind of tipping point. Um, you know, I think the next decade really will be about um, will be about action, and I think uh, it's uh, it's an exciting time to be having this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm really struck by a fact that is not talked about much, which is that half of all the carbon pollution put into the atmosphere by humanity is dealt with by nature today, about 30% about by on the land and about 20, 25 by, by oceans. These natural climate sinks are huge, they're, they're fragile, they're not infinite. Um, 
And I think rallying around that fact, though, is and sort of moving from from the high elevation of nature and the opening of, of Glasgow, you know, it's it's a chance to bring sort of the different factions of nature together. You know, soil carbon is the basis of soil fertility and water management and food security, frankly, right? There's the biodiversity crisis. There's the climate dimension. There's flood control. There's seagrass beds and their roles in, 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 in corals and mangroves. And, and, and it just feels to me like we, we have a real opportunity here to bring these different interests in, in nature and its role in a sustainable world together and to therefore build up a much bigger uh, constituency uh, advancing it. Fantastic. Um, well, I, I, I'm certain I, I speak for um, a, a lot of us who have uh, li listened to you this evening to say that uh, th this has really been uh, inspiring. Uh, it's, it's really been insightful. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for, uh, for sharing uh, some of your work with us for this last uh, hour and a half or so. Uh, I, I wanna encourage uh, any of the audience members now or anybody who watches this uh, subsequently to uh, connect on the Tomcat uh, LinkedIn networking hub. That's one way to connect with us uh, and uh, with Dan and Matt. We can either put you in touch directly or, um, or indirectly. Um, those of you who are contemplating solutions for the Tomcat Solutions um, program and who would like to engage Dan or Matt um, with, uh, in their expertise in helping you develop your ideas, um, please also uh, reach out to us so, so we can help uh, connect you uh, with both of them. So uh, thank you again for, uh, for your, uh, your insights tonight. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for, for joining us and interrupting your, your sleep cycle. Uh, and, and thanks everyone for, for being here.